so, I'm, so I'm, I know I'm the last person standing between you and the beers right now, uh, but this talk is about interrupts, so feel free to interrupt me if I'm talking about stuff uh, that you feel is worth having more details. Uh, yeah, I cannot dodge any question. <laughs> uh, so just a bit about my, myself. Uh, so I joined ARM in the Linux kernel team in June 2017. That was my first job in the kernel, uh, in the kernel space. Uh, so I'm fairly a newbie in terms of kernel stuff. And this is the first major work I did in kernel. Uh, so I'm a bit in a particular place because I did leave ARM very recently, but all that I'm presenting here is uh, was done as part of ARM. Um, so we're going to talk about NMIs, and first of all, just a brief about IRQs. Uh, to put it simply, it's just a manifestation of, of an event that happens in the system. This event can be triggered by some software or by some device, or it's just something happened. You might want to do something about that. And it interrupts the current flow of execution, meaning that your CPU was executing something and will just jump to some other code location and hopefully handle it properly. Uh, because this this uh, interruption of the f normal flow of execution can be a bit annoying. We have some primitives in the kernel that allow you to enable and disable interrupts so that when you're doing something important and you don't want to be bothered by an interrupt, you can just say, no, I don't want to deal with those. And so now that we have that, we we'll also have non-maskable interrupts. Uh, so basically, it's an interrupt that can still happen when we decided to disable interrupts. Uh, so they can be used for debugging uh, some error handling to, to, to report some hardware status, uh, having some timers that we, we, we don't want to miss and things like that. Uh, and for the rest, they are like uh, pretty much architecture specific, like x86 does it one way where, you, where it's a completely separate exception entry. You have one handler, this is uh, one handler for the NMIs and this, uh, when you come from this handler, you know you had an NMI. For Spark, it's just some interrupts, but they have a special priority and uh, the highest priority means that it's an NMI and that you cannot max mask it. Although it's more or less true because in the latest versions of Sparks, of Spark, I believe that you can mask non-maskable interrupts, but that's another detail. <laughs> um, so in Linux for NMI handlers, there is a, a specific context that has been defined. Uh, so basically whenever you are entering an NMI context, which is an, a context that can interrupt normal flow of execution while interrupts were disabled, uh, you call the NMI enter and exit it with NMI exit. It just informs some system-wide features like printk, ftrace, and RCU and others. So for instance, for printk, it tells it uh, Oh, please use different buffers so that you don't mess up all the other buffers that are trying to print relevant information. Uh, for ftrace, I think, I believe it just disables it, hopefully. Uh, and, uh, and so because of this, whenever you enter an NMI context, uh, it's the first uh, NMI enter is the first thing that you should call before entering uh, C code, or at least traceable C code. Otherwise, you're, uh, otherwise you might try to call ftrace. Uh, 
Where is the mic? It's on. How about now? There we go. Now it's fine. No, um, F trace runs perfectly fine in into my mode. Okay, I. I no, what it does is it, ha it puts the, it changes the context. So okay, it needs to know the context. Okay, it's like print K. It's just another context. It's just another con. It just says it, so it doesn't. It knows that it's going. It could rewrite in itself. But oh, yes, okay. it works perfectly fine in into my mode. Okay. Okay. Um, so just uh, some restrictions. <laughs> Uh, some some restrictions put in place by the uh, uh, well the different assumptions that Linux makes. Uh, you cannot have any mind ne nesting. Uh, you cannot trigger preemption, task preemption for an NMI context. Uh, so it keeps the NMI handler simpler. Otherwise, I don't know how you would deal, for instance, with the print K buffers or or just restoring the proper context of a task that was interrupted while you didn't want to have uh, interrupts. So um, another thing is that generally when you write some code that you want to be able to use both from interrupts and, uh, and non-interrupt context, like uh, you have a device driver that has that has some shared data that is the global counter there, uh, and that both the the device interrupts will modify the counter and uh, the the normal uh, non-interrupt code of the driver, like configuration or whatever, uh, writing to registers or I don't know, might also modify the counter. Generally, you just protect it with some uh, spin locks, disabling the uh, interrupts. And uh, so as is, this function could be called either from while modifying global data, uh, can be called either from IOQ context or non-IOQ context. But if you're using an interrupt, the, the IRQ save will disable IRQs, but uh, when you're using NMI, uh, the IRQ save will disable the interrupts, but not NMIs. So basically, you have no more protection. Uh, so the spin locks, when, when you're using an NMI, you really shouldn't rely on spin locks. It can protect you from concurrency, but just use a MOTAX in that case, uh, because that's what they're for. So, yeah, that's what needs to be, what you need to take care of. So, we, we have, uh, so, okay, we, we have this N concept of NMI, but it seems a bit of a hassle. Like, we, you need to take care of a lot of stuff, uh, can mess up <coughs> things pretty quickly. So why do we want it? And uh, the reason is perf. Uh, who doesn't know what perf is? Okay. <laughs> so, so perf is a, is a subsystem in Linux that defines some events that, uh, that allow you to monitor what is going on within the system. So it can be uh, CPU cycles, uh, cache misses, branch prediction uh, related data. And you, so you can collect the, the stats and you can also do sampling of the events. So every X time the one event happens, you just uh, look at, well, uh, you just, uh, um, you, you just record, okay, I, my event up happened in this function, and so you can make up see stati statistics of uh, well, most of the time this event happens. I'm in this function or something like that, and uh, so we have this. So I'm running perf. Um, quick question. 
Yes. Okay, so uh, why do you need NMI for perf? Doesn't ARM have some sort of performance monitoring unit which gives you all these statistics instead? Well, that's great because that's what I'm about to talk uh, <laughs> to, to say. So, <laughs> so basically, here I'm running a, a perf on, a, on an ARM64 machine. Yep. So I'm running perf on an ARM64 machine. And uh, so we, we have this, uh, as you said, there is this uh, performance monitoring unit. There is this performance monitoring unit that allows us to record what happens, uh, to record hardware events. And uh, here you see that we spend a lot of time in raw spin IUQ restore. Like uh, I've been running it since uh, since, uh, I don't know, midday or something like that, recording stats. And uh, most of the time is, is spent in uh, Rospin unlock uh, IRQ restore, which basically just releases a lock, so it shouldn't be blocking, and uh, restores uh, the, an interrupt status. And so what's going on is actually What's going on is that the, the performance monitor unit, uh, when we are doing sampling, it, uh, when a certain amount of, of events happened, it triggers an interrupt. And that interrupt, once we are in that interrupt, we can just see, oh, our interrupt happened at this location. Uh, at this location in the kernel code. And the thing is that when events uh, that we're monitoring happened, uh, while we have interrupt disabled, uh, we won't take the interrupts because we disable interrupts. We don't want to be bothered by interrupts. And the issue is that our interrupt is pending, so we'll have to deal with it at some point. And that point is basically when we re-enable interrupts. So we have interrupts disabled. Uh, I don't know. I uh, I've executed a thousand uh, a, a thousand in instruction. My uh, my event counter triggers the interrupt, and then nothing happens. Uh, we re-enable interrupts. We take the interrupt, and perf starts processing, but wrongly assumes that that uh, the, the, the event happened while, when we enable the interrupt. So that's why we get uh, this weird report that uh, what's taking most of the activity here is, uh, is Rospin and Locker IAQ restored. Okay, and so on ARM64, uh, contrary to, to, to x86, we don't have an architected NMI. We don't have a, a direct way of producing an NMI. But what we do have is interrupt priorities and priority masking. And what we can do is uh, mimic the behavior of an interrupt uh, of an NMI using an interrupt and for this we just need to make use the priorities to make the distinction between an NMI and an IRQ so basically an NMI is a high priority stuff kind of how spark work uh, spark NMI work and um, and IRQ just have a, a standard priority uh, and when we have this, uh, this interrupt disabling, we just mask the normal IQs, making sure the NMI can still fire. Uh, 
so this is pretty easy, well, pretty easy. This is uh, accessible on Linux because currently we only use one priority everywhere. All interrupts have the same priority in Linux. But that's about to change. <laughs> uh, so just a small uh, mention of how the interrupt control works on ARM64. So we have this, uh, uh, for, for each CPU, there is this register, uh, well, register, this uh, process state uh, that has uh, an IR qubit that allows, that can be toggled to uh, either enable or disable IR queues. So you can just check this. Uh, so this is what is used behind the local RQ enable and disable primitives of Linux. This is what uh, generic code will indirectly modify uh, uh, as the ARM64 backend. And um, so it, pre as I mentioned er earlier, it just prevents the CPU to jump to interrupt handling code when there is an interrupt pending. Uh, but the issue is that it's just a single bit, so we don't have much more control than this. We can just say, okay, it's enabled or it's disabled. We don't have more values than that. Um, and so for those who know a bit about ARM32, there is this FIQ stuff, uh, the fast interrupt. Uh, but on... Uh, on ARM64, we can't really use FIQs and actually look the, the, the ARM64 port of Linux does not use FIQs at all uh, because they are reserved for secure firmware and secure OS. So we just cannot use them. Under certain contexts, you could cause them to trigger, uh, to, to deal with NMIs but it's not something that you have always available. So just in case you wonder why we did not go that route, that's why. Um, so we have to look a bit further with the, the interrupt controller, the, the ARM generic interrupt controller. So, um, so for... Um, with the ARM's uh, generic interrupt controller, we have a CPU interface uh, that provides a bank of register that allows you to have control uh, over the interrupts that are coming. So you can acknowledge them, you can, you can mask them, you can see if you have any interrupts pending on, th on, on that CPU and things like that. And then you have a big blob that is just the interrupt configurations uh, that distributes the, the interrupts over all the different CPUs that uh, the, basically all the device interrupt lines are connected to this stuff over there. Um, and, and so the priorities for each individual interrupts are set in the general Eric interrupt controller over there. And then you have this stuff in between. Uh, each CPU gets its own interface to manage the interrupts that it receives. And, and the interesting part is that there is, among the registers, there is this register called PMR that is the priority masking register uh, that basically allows the CPU to, to filter out the interrupts it doesn't want. It sets a value in that register and any interrupt that has lower priority just is not sent to the CPU. So we, we, we won't see it. Uh, we won't see it and we won't jump to the, to the handler code. So to fit that in Linux, the idea can be quite simple. It's just, uh, well, we stop touching the, the program state i bit, and in the, the enabling and disabling functions, we just start choosing PMR, must the interrupts to disable them, and that's it. And then 
in the in the generic intro controller we set the proper priority for the for, for the interrupts that are uh, that we are interested in so yeah ideally pretty easy but the thing is that like on most architectures when you take an interrupt your um, uh, your, your interrupt flags, so in our case the p state i bit uh, gets, uh, gets set properly to disable interrupts so that when you are handling an interrupt you don't just get an interrupt again. So we still need to touch that p state i bit to always have it uh, allowing interrupts so that we are always using the PMR. And uh, there are some contexts where we cannot use PMR for interrupt disabling, and that's because of how, uh, how uh, because of how the 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 the, the, the interrupt is sent to the CPU. Because if an interrupt is masked by uh, by PMR, the interrupt is not sent at all to the CPU. So the behavior is slightly different. So most of the time you don't notice it, but in some context uh, where your CPU relies on being able to see a pending interrupt, if, if it was masked by PMR, well, you don't see it. And anything that is relying on that, like getting out of a KVM guest or getting out of, uh, of an idle state won't work. So, so we still need to kind of deals, deal with this uh, double-headed monster that has uses PMR on one side and the, the standard I bit on the other. And uh, well, once we reach the generic code that just uses the local RQ enable and disable, we need to make sure that we are always in a consistent state. That uh, yeah, there is a question. Where's the key? Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's working. Uh, so I'm not sure I can get the benefits of having the PMR before the CPU. What's the benefit of it? <laughs> uh, before the CPU? You mean that that's instead of uh, the changing the P state of the CPU, you use the PMR? The, 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 thing, the thing is that there, there are two different bits of uh, of hardware, right? Uh, you you really you would need to see that as a CPU could or could not have the CPU interface. And why are different interrupt controllers CPU? Yes, as well. Like for instance, the the Raspberry Pi doesn't have a kick. Yeah, and it's uh, something else. It's not. Uh, mm. Uh, so it's just that it's modularity, I guess. Uh, yeah. um, how big is the PMR? Is it like a single register or is it like multiple registers? Because if I remember correctly, the gig can have like hundreds of interrupt sources on the left side and there is one coming out on the right side. So how big is the PMR? Uh, the PMR is, is there like the, a priority the, 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 for each no, interrupt no, no, source? The, the, the PMR does not filter individual interrupts. It filters priorities. Okay. And gotcha. so and there is a range of uh, so it's uh, four bits. Uh, it's somewhere between four bits and uh, and eight bits, depending on the gig implementation. So it's more on the like a right side of the gig CPU interface. That's that's where it filters the priorities. Yes. So, okay. Uh, gotcha. Thanks. So you said the you you have a whole bunch of interrupt uh, configuration in the generic uh, in the gig, and uh, among those configuration there is the interrupt priority that you set for each individual interrupt. But those priorities are coded between four and eight bits, and then you have uh, the same uh, well. Uh, same range of value for PMR, and everything that is lower just doesn't go through uh, in terms of priorities. Uh, 
So if, if I understand your design correctly, you have this hybrid scheme where sometimes you use the P-State-I for KVM guests and things of this nature, and then you use the PMR when you can, correct? Well, it's, yeah, basically, before running uh, KVM guests, uh, we set the uh, we set the I bit because we know that we want interrupts for the host disabled at that point. That's how the ARM sixty four works. Okay, point. so I'm asking <laughs> I'm asking does does this mean that inside a KVM guest you won't get accurate purge events? Uh, because you no, don't have no, to be, no because uh, it works. It's not because you have disabled interrupts for the host. That you have disabled them for the. Oh, I see. It's completely separate. Yeah. I understand. Thank you. It's a bit more. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah. So now that we found how to 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 have an interrupt that uh, that gets triggered wh while uh, while interrupts are disabled, so some some kind of NMI. Uh, the question is how, how can we use it? How can I have a, a device that wants to use the NMI? Uh, how do we do that? So at first, uh, I, I introduced, so the thing is that setting up an NMI will be different for every uh, for every interrupt controller, because each interrupt controller will work in its own way. And uh, the interface between a device driver and the, the interrupt controller goes through generic code, the generic IRQ chip module. And so I had to f find something that gives me, uh, gives a, an interface for the, the for the device driver to say, okay, I want an NMI, which will then call into the, the IRQ controller uh, driver. And I tried uh, slipping that in the uh, IRQ uh, chip state, uh, saying, okay, well, I, I have IRQs, they can either be NMI or not. The thing is that I had a bit of a misunderstanding of what this enum was used for, and so I had a, a nice answer saying that, yeah, you can do what you're trying to do, but it's really, really not the proper way, and that that was fair because the RQ chip state is more to describe uh, the activity of an RQ, whether it's pending, whether it's active, whether what what is going on uh, with that interrupt, and it can be modified at any time in the life cycle of an interrupt. Whereas an NMI, I'm not going to say, well, I'm in the middle of handling this interrupt, but suddenly I want to change this. I want to change my interrupt to not be an NMI. Uh, this cannot happen. So it was clearly not the right interface. So, so Thomas called me rightly on that. And, <laughs> and so, we we proposed an NMI API uh, in the generic code, which is very similar to the to the IRQ API to request uh, to request for a device that requests interrupts, uh, and uh, but it's a bit more reduced. There there is less flexibility, and it's just uh, so we we have. Just request an MI, free an MI, enable the NMI and disable the NMI, and you make sure that you don't mix up the NMI and equivalent IRQ functions. And then, as I said, we need to call back into the uh, the interrupt controller driver. So for this, I had a bunch of uh, uh, a bunch of changes for the IRQ chip, which were was adding just uh, an indication whether the, the wh whether NMIs are supported by the chip and some uh, basically the setup callbacks and uh, in the case of uh, 
in in the case of the the the, the geek uh, the generic interrupt controller for m64 what this does the nmi setup basically sets the priority of the set, uh, sets the priority of the the of an interrupt high enough so that it can uh, so that it's not uh, blocked by the pmr and uh, tear down uh, and Otherwise, by default, we have the intro priority, the, the default one. Okay, and, and so now that we have this, let's see how things are going. So this is once we have DNMI, and well, we see that we still have the raw IRQ restore, but it's in the one point, uh, and it's going down. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's not like before, all the way up using about 12% uh, or something. Uh, yeah, 14% yeah, 14, uh, 14 or something like that. Uh, now, now we have a better profiling, a better idea of what is going on in the system, more accurate, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would like to say, um, so pr previously, uh, ah. uh, w yeah. what you uh, you knew only was that you were spending roughly thirteen percent CPU with interrupts disabled, in fact. Uh, yeah, something like that, uh, and not uh, not even because the events the event could happen uh, In anywhere. Uh, yeah, it, it, yes, but it, it, and the, and it, it means that we're spending at least fifteen percent <coughs> with interrupts disabled. Fifteen percent hit and interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it, it, it strikes anywhere uh, with interrupts disabled and it's reported at the end. Yeah. So this whole NMI thing looks more like an interrupt prioritization implementation, doesn't it? So, uh, I mean, because the gig supports that, did you implement something which would be like generic interrupt prioritization? Because I believe that would be very useful. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, oh, 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 oh. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Hold on. I know I knew you wanted to. Yeah, I know you want to say something. But anyway, first, um, doesn't PowerPC do something like this already? No, it doesn't software. It, does, uh, it never disables interrupts. It just gets the interrupts. Yeah, but I know. Uh, okay, so it does it that way. Okay, because I thought it was similar in PowerPC. And the second thing I did, I was just checking my phone, uh, checking the code. By the way, I have to. Um, there used to be content. F trace uh, NMI enter used to do something. It's actually a no op in every architecture except for Super H. Is Super H even still supported? Yes. <laughs> okay, but it's the only one actually it does something is Super H. Okay. And if you have the hardware latency detector, it actually it uses it to detect when an NMI happened for the hardware latency. But then. So uh, there, this uh, interrupt prioritization discussion comes up every other year. <laughs> and so far, nobody ever made a real case for it. It's just always the argument, oh, that would be cool to have. Yeah, and then what would you do with that? I don't know, but it would be cool. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, no. Yeah, but this is just no, a binary thing. This states. is a very binary implementation, and actually we are looking into the same thing on x86, unfortunately, uh, because the APIC has uh, a task priority reg register, which is pretty much the same thing than your PMR, and there's a... Um, CR8, with CR8 you can actually write to it, but it's extremely slow, so that would, if we replace every local IRQ disable enable with a, peer, uh, a write to CR8, that would actually be a performance regression, which is massive. So that's why we haven't done it yet. So we, 
basically if we want to do that on, on x86, and there's a reason to do it because we have only one NMI line, and so all NMI sources have to share the NMI. Uh, and shared interrupts are a horrible thing because you have to figure out where it comes from, which makes NMI processing slow and painful. So, uh, but other than that binary thing, there's really no point in having interrupt priorities. That's going to be an utter mess if you try to make that generic, because not all architectures support it in the same way. And we don't want to end up with nested interrupts again. We had that before, where people were randomly enabling interrupts in interrupt handlers, causing stack overflows and what the hell. No, we don't go back to that one. <laughs> now, for, the, for, the, for this very binary uh, NMI emulation thing, it's perfectly fine. And I think the, what we have now is pretty good describing it and architectures which have a fast way to access the, the priority register can just use it. So I wish we had that on an x86. So the idea what we have right now is basically do the power PC thing, do a software disabling of interrupts, only disable them when they ever hit in a software disabled region, and then replay them. And other than that, um, <coughs> Uh, keep uh, uh, use the, the, the CRA to actually do the, the NMI game, but only rarely write to it. So, uh, so how how is how is that uh, PMR write compared to fiddling with the P state bit on ARM sixty four performance wise? Uh, so initially we had some. Uh, the the performance impact is actually pretty low. It's below 1% uh, impact um, uh, but there, there are some some cases where we need the data barrier uh, to propagate the, the PMR value up to the gig but and here the performances can go up to 4 or 5 percent but these circumstances are basically uh, your firmware messed up the configuration. You're, uh, you shouldn't be in such a con configuration. So we try to detect it so that we can get rid of that barrier. And this was a patch that got in after, after my first uh, set of series. And, uh, but yeah, we try to detect in which case we are. But just when you just need the PMR rights, uh, you, you, uh, the the impact is quite negligible. Uh, it's not it's not nothing, but it's uh, it's in the noise. But it's not massive. No, it's yeah, completely the CR, acceptable. CRA to replacement we tried on x86 is massive. It's more than five percent on oh. regular on a kernel compiled. Oh yeah, okay. Which I know a certain person which is not in the room would hate. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, well, so we don't have time. So just a bit of uh, context of how the def development went. So initially, uh, the work was started by uh, by Daniel Thompson from Linaro. His last version was uh, was from uh, three years ago now, and. Uh, so it was seven patches. It, it did the PMR enabling and disabling, and he tested it with some NMI, um, uh, some uh, just some API that triggered a backtrace on demand and that could not be blocked. Uh, me, I started working uh, on it uh, just a short while after joining ARM. Uh, at first, I just uh, it was just some rebase adapting the perf driver. Uh, so that it was uh, so that it could be NMI safe, and uh, so for so then for a while I I just did some rebase bug fixes, but I didn't have big feedback on it. Uh, and at some point I had this review, which basically states as it is, this patch is almost impossible to review, and quite honestly, it was very true. It was 
a big patch that was kind of doing the the, um, the replacement of the i bits with PMR, but also was taking in charge all the quirks, and I needed a big split up. And when it's quite an interesting exercise because when they say it's quite impossible to review, you look at it and you realize, oh my god, it's also actually quite hard to untangle. But in the end, you get to it, and from six patches, you get to 26 patches. <laughs> uh, so that was V4. Uh, it gets on a bit. So then there was the the next version, there was a discussion with Thomas about having a separate NMI, so that was four more patches separate, but we still, I still had around 25 patches. Uh, and in the end, I had a V10 that got merged, uh, well, uh, a year and a half after I started working at, on it. Uh, so V10 plus uh, six version for the NMI API, uh, about 30 patches in total, uh, was quite a good ride. And then uh, that's uh, about um, a month after, a month of two or two after, I get, uh, I get a report. Oh, uh, when I use the F-Trace uh, graph, uh, graph tracer, the system just hangs and nothing happens. And I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure I tested this and all that. And uh, it, the, the guy just sent me, uh, well, on top of the report, he sent me a patch just disabling tracing in the interrupt handler. And so, yeah, it did work, but it felt like more hiding uh, the, me the, the deep depth. Send me the crash. <laughs> yeah, he sent you, you were in copy, no? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm pretty, I but, but any, anyway, that was my fault, and uh, in the end, uh, we fixed, uh, I fixed it, kind of reworking all my quirks on uh, uh, moving, uh, switching uh, from, uh, from, uh, from pstate.si to, uh, to PMR, and in 5.3, I have something that works, it was merged, and uh, hopefully you can try it. But you will need uh, uh, an ARM64 platform with GigV3, uh, so five dot, uh, Linux 5.3 or, or later. And well, because initially we had this, uh, this performance impact uh, under certain configuration, it has been kind of gated behind uh, uh, a build option and a, and a common light option. Uh, but uh, probably in the, f in the future, we should simplify that. Uh, the ARM PMU patches uh, still haven't been merged. Send them again. <laughs> yes, uh, but uh, yeah, I, ne I need constant access to GigD3 hardware. <laughs> it's harder now. Uh, so I don't know if... So yeah, one of the reasons... Um, I said we are uh, you need gigv3 the reason uh, we don't plan to support gigv2 is also because gigv3 has a direct uh, uh, cpu registers while uh, gigv2 has memory mapped registers which are much slower and it's also very annoying because it means that you need to keep track instead of having a uh, just a register write that the CPU can access directly. You would need to know the base address of your register bank with memory mapped registers and uh, access that from local IRQ enable and disable. So it's doable, but it would have terrible performance. And it's, I don't know if it's really usable. It's probably very ugly to do. And so thanks for listening, and uh, if there are questions. Uh, so uh, when I looked at this like a year, year and a half ago, mm -hmm. I remember there was like performance issues and things like that. So 
how practical is this to enable on a production system? Like, do you see performance performance hit with uh, VMR? It, it, honestly, it depends on your firmware. On what firmware? Yeah, it depends on your firmware. But you will see in the in the list of uh, CPU features, uh -huh. uh, you it will notify you. Uh, whether you need that uh, that <laughs> barrier that aff uh, that greatly affects performance or not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just to elaborate. Yeah, for instance, or other firmwares. Yeah, there, there are basically there's two ways that you can be configured by the firmware, and in one way you have to have a DSP, which is our most expensive. Push your stores to the end of the earth. Don't execute any instructions till they're completed. <laughs> uh, type thing. And most firmwares uh, should be configured so you don't need to do that. But if they're not, then every time you change the PMR, i.e. every time you call local RQ, disable or enable, you have to wait for everything to complete. And that obviously sucks. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I believe we don't have more time for it. But thank you. Uh, I, I'm still th still there for the other two days, so feel free to come and talk to me. And <laughs>